Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Wake Up Missoula. I'm your host, Scott Ramp, here to usher you into the day. It is July 28th. I will be gone next Friday, but I will be talking about a lot of stuff that's happening here in the city of Missoula, which includes a series of follow-ups with your city council in terms of the Chinese uh, cemetery memorial, not to mention, on top of that, the budget season and the... Um, some of the issues that's going on in terms of uh, how close the city of Missoula is to reopening the Johnson Street Shelter and how they are going to be trying to uh, reach out to neighborhoods in the Johnson Street area and also the Pavarello Center to make sure that the citizens in the area are well informed. So that's one of the things that we're going to be move, moving right into. So we're going to jump right in. It is uh, fire season is technically upon us and as uh, we are dealing with a fire near Condon. Management team number one um, is managing the Colt Fire near Condon. In Montana, it was able to provide some good news about the Colt Fire. Although they emphasize that the fire season has just begun, so the fire could burn until fall. The Colt Fire has burned an estimated 4,400 acres, but as slow Tuesday after a cold front passed through the region on Monday night, bringing cooler temperatures uh, that gave crews an opportunity to conduct prescribed burning Wednesday along the eastern edge of the fire at Colt Lake Road for service 646. Missoula Current reports the fire is still north of West Fork of the Clearwater River and movement north of the fire, uh, if any, is slow. Um, this is better news because this fire has the entire Montana fire crews looking at this fire aside from the uh, many fires that may have been happening otherwise. Uh, usually we can get fires as early as June and most likely after uh, the July 4th celebration and tourist season goes into full swing for parks and camping. 11 counties in Montana have been declared states of emergency in terms of droughts in this past week or so. Governor, Governor Greg Drew and Forte declared a state of emergency this week asking federal government aid for drought. Um, which includes Missoula and Ravalli counties. The 14-day forecast for Western Montana calls for an above average temperatures and above average precipitation according to the National Weather Service. Uh, Missoula's average precipitation around this year is around 9 inches and we're currently at 7.6 inches of precipitation. Uh, Kalispell is typically 11 and uh, just received about 5.2 inches. I've heard anecdotally is that uh, some of the uh, the Flathead Lake itself is much lower than it uh, tends to be this time of year. In fire related news, the Canadian fire is ongoing becoming a major issue for Canadians and their southern neighbors in terms of smoke. The EPA of Illinois Illinois has declared an air pollution action day through Tuesday due to the persistent wildfire smoke causing elevated air pollution in the region. Similar advisories have been declared in Michigan and Wisconsin. This is a big kind of a big deal. Uh, Canadian wildfires, you know, half of the country, if not more, is considered forest land. And a big part of this uh, also has to do with the fact that there are not many trails and access to a lot of these areas. So the fire is basically being taken care of from the air. And there isn't too much access for crews to be able to get down there and get the uh, uh, equipment that they need to be able to put out all of these fires. And so far, uh, there are over 1,000 fires that are currently burning, and there isn't much access to the can thick Canadian wilderness. So um, that's kind of what's going on right now. Uh, many uh, eastern areas are dealing with a lot of the smoke fallout. Missoula, we also had uh, some of the smoke uh, from Canada about in June or sometime ago, where we did have some of the northern fronts from the Canadian Arctic winds push it down to uh, the Missoula Valley area. And we had to deal with smoke pro probably about a day, two days, two and a half days overall, but many of the places in the East Coast have been dealing with ongoing uh, smoke and poor air quality, on top of the fact that many communities in Toronto and Canada themselves are dealing with extreme poor air quality as well. So let's talk about some more popular news. Uh, some of the things that are happening as well is that UFOs, yes, I'm talking about UFOs, if I only had my tinfoil hat. But yes, jokes aside, Wednesday saw a series of folks testifying in Congress about their experiences with flying objects, UFOs, UAPs, as they changed the name for that. They have no trace of human-based technology, and for the most part, these folks came down under oath in front of Congress to tell their stories and demand answers to a decades-old question. Are we alone? If not, why haven't we been told what's going on? Even though what's going on may create even more questions that one can dismiss or ignore. One of the folks in charge of the UAP program, retired Major General David Gorsh, uh, spoke to Congress and was uh, given key testimony on this matter, asked whether the U.S. government had informed uh, about extraterrestrial life. Uh, Gruch said that U.S. likely has been aware of non-human activity since the 1930s. So that's kind of what's going on with that. Plausible deniability is a good way to keep those secrets and discredit folks in many ways. 
uh, their stories are part of the picture that seems like the story may snowball, but there's just a little bit more waiting and many who testified were happy that this will be going on to the National Congressional Record. So uh, let's see, let's talk about other things that happened. This Wednesday, uh, we had Wednesdays with the mayor in which they discussed the uh, tax code and they looked at the tax reform in Missoula and many other communities looking to get the state allocated funds for communities to elevate the tax burden on our communities. In the past, Missoula has relied on logging, timber, Smurfit stone industry for a lot of their tax base to uh, add to the community in terms of taxes. But the 90s kind of saw harder times for the city of Missoula. You know, our population was fairly low. It was kind of like a quiet kind of neighborhood. There wasn't much going on downtown just in general. Um, and, you know, even real uh, re retail stores and all that stuff moved over to the Southgate Mall. You know, 90s was a very quiet time in Missoula. 2000s saw like a big push for the uh, incarnation of you know, ur urban renewal districts. You know, taxes for businesses to come together is like hey we want to improve our downtown we got, want, want to make our town more accessible not only for our citizens but also more appealing for tourists to get that sweet sweet tourist money coming in so they established five districts in the state of Montana called the tourist biz uh, the tourism business improvement district Missoula was one of them and so with this uh, and over uh, the course of like the last 20 years or so uh, we have topped out with about 3.5 million people visiting the city of Missoula a year. And this isn't just people passing through, these are people actually staying in the hotels in the city of Missoula and more. So um, Smurfit Stone closed, the housing crisis happened, and just a lot of different issues uh, happened in the city of Missoula. And so a lot of the tax burden basically became, uh, uh, went up on the people. And so as a result, the rent went up and just a lot of things, this is kind of snowballed. So most of this meeting, I'm not going to show you any clips of like that, was very much like a repeat of what the city has been talking about is how the, the state has a surplus of funding in which they haven't uh, really allocated to the citizens. Uh, well, they haven't reallocated in terms of, you know, more communities a lot of the blame game, and then their simple solutions was wanting to create a sales tax, which unfortunately for Montana, uh, sales tax is political suicide. Uh, but they also soldiered on and they uh, looked into getting that gas tax. And I've probably repeated this so many different times, but the gas tax was an option that communities could do to increase uh, a couple cents on the dollar per gallon for people coming through town during peak seasons of tourism, summer and all that kind of stuff, and use some of that money for roads and other things that the 3.5 million people come to use, including services uh, in terms of fire, rescue, and the police department as well. So the simple solution was uh, put into place, county voted on it, it was a slim margin, um, but it was passed, but then the state of Montana overturned the results and that source of revenue was cut off completely. And so far, the city of Missoula does have four sources of revenue, none of which happens to be from the state of Montana. And it has a lot to do with federal aid in terms of build grants, um, block grants, uh, the Biden's Build Back Better federal gra uh, grants that usually take application skills and uh, money matching uh, on top of that. So that's a big one on that. Thing. And then uh, the one source of local revenue is the Affordable Housing Trust Fund, which allocates funding for um, property assets the uh, Missoula has, require, uh, has acquired and sold off, and the money goes towards this Affordable Housing Trust Fund. But in many ways, it's not necessarily sustainable because in terms of property, if one were to sell property, and not to mention, Missoula has come to certain uh, levels of scrutiny just because buying land and selling it is like, why are we getting, why is the city of Missoula getting into the real estate business in a way when they should just be keeping the lights on. So that was one of the many controversial items going back and forth. Um, just a lot of things. You can check out the uh, Wednesdays with the mayor. Uh, it happens every fourth Wednesday of the month live here at the uh, Missoula Public Library. But then you can watch the replay, which we upload to our Facebook and YouTube. You can find us, Missoula Community Media Resource or MCAT TV Missoula. All right, so that's about there. Uh, today we have a series of videos that we're going to be posting online from the uh, last animation camp week. So we've had three weeks of animation camp. I'm going to show you a little taste of this during my break. And when I come back, we're going to talk about some movies and games.
Oh, getting too old for this. Junior, look at the sword I got. Dad, I don't care about a sword. It's, I care about the diamonds. I'll go play with my sword over here. Okay, let's do this thing. Uh, here we go. Hmm, that's fine. Ah! No, please stop! Junior, I'm. Oh, you dropped your hat. Let's go home, Dad. I'm right there with you, boy. Hey, Missoula, Mark Moss from Tell Us Something here. Wanting to let you know that we are looking for storytellers for our next live storytelling event. The event takes place on September 28th. The theme is Lost in Translation. If you would like to pitch your story for Lost in Translation, call 406-203-4683. The pitch deadline is August 20th. As soon as I hear your pitch, I will call you and let you know that I got it. And from there, if you're selected, we'll workshop our stories together and there is a group workshop. Please pitch your story for Lost in Translation by calling 406-203-4682. Thanks. Hey guys, welcome back. Let's talk about some movies that are coming out this weekend. It's time for Pre-Critic, where I pre-judge a movie based on absolutely uh, nothing. Uh, no, wait, wait, I'm not done with the show yet. Okay, hey, okay, let's restart. Okay, jumping right in, we're kicking things off with The Haunted Mansion. It's a series of uh, hauntings that are based on the, uh, uh, the ride at Disneyland. Hey, they did uh, uh, Tomorrowland. Thought that movie was okay. This one stars uh, has Owen Wilson in the movie. They have a, a other series of actors in this movie, but primarily this is going to be a series of uh, people going into the quote unquote haunted mansion, trying to get out as soon as possible because that is exactly what the ride's all about: is being trapped. Hey, I liked it better when they did the uh, Muppets uh, Mansion movie, where Kermit didn't sound like Kermit. He kind of sounded like. Uh, not Kermit. That's basically what I have to say about that. But this movie, you can expect chills, thrills, and not enough uh, kind of like, you know, Disney-related re horror elements, so it's not going to be that scary, even though they might have a couple uh, elements in there that might terrify some kids. But for the most part, I, I, I pretty much can guarantee that there's going to be a couple people who uh, go into the Haunted Mansion, have a couple gags, and then escape while the Haunted Mansion, like, like implodes or something. It's going to be one of those kind of like CGI heavy movies that I don't even know was really coming out this weekend. Watch uh, Barbenheimer. Um, up next, we have a horror film called, um, uh, ooh, uh, sorry, uh, Talk to Me, which kind of sounds like an old like uh, show about therapy, but we'll talk a little bit more about this movie where it's uh, basically you touch this hand in this picture right here, and you summon demons. But when you open a window to see what it's like to talk to a demon, but some people, a door opens, ooh, a demon comes back, and then and basically uh, it's about possession and a bunch of uh, young adults uh, that only uh, Bl uh, Blumhouse knows exactly how to exploit for their movies to uh, kind of do their acting, screaming, and pretend to be demons while they're possessed and then trying to get out of it because, you know, young people deserve to die in horror films. That's just kind of how these kind of tropes go. And now we're going to move on to something a little bit more lighter. It's called Viewfinder. And it's a game that just came out uh, a couple weeks ago that's kind of making it circuit around. The whole point of the game is that you take a picture um, and you can use pictures to impose an image on the screen. Sound kind of confusing? So just imagine like if you hold up a picture and then you take down the picture and it's like, oh wait, the picture has now been applied to the real world and I can use it for things like that. So basically the game is very much like portal or a wannabe portal in which you know you get from one place to another platformer first person it's pretty much a straightforward kind of game you know games are you know probably have a couple things here and there but for the most part that's uh, kind of what this is all about all right so confused yes so am i let's move on so we're going to talk about uh the dubbing stuff from the movie uh, 1949 movie, Rope of Sand. This is a Burt Lancaster movie, so without further ado, here is the new dub and stuff. When, when I come back, we're going to talk about some city council. Uh, get out of here and give me some money. Hey, how's it going? Were you just singing right now? 
Excuse me? Why do you think... Whatever, I'll just pretend I'm invisible. I knew you would be coming in here. No suit. Uh, I like your eye patch, Clark. Did, did the accent come with it? I'm practicing for a role. A Danish role. Ha ha ha. Of course, I'm only jesting to you. For I don't need an eye patch. How much do you want for your glass eye? Oh yes, dollar sixty. Oh wow, that's uh, quite a deal you got for me. Mm-hmm. And no, I do not have change for a hundred, so you're going to have to uh, break that up for me, if you don't mind. Well, I guess that's no sale for me. Oh, you don't want to have a thick wallet with singles? Well, unless those singles are craft singles. I didn't know you liked eating C4. Hmm, where was I? One, two, three, four, f okay, here you go. One thousand percent tip. <laughs> so what you're telling me is that you bought a dollar sixty I for three hundred dollars? <laughs> That's stupid. Well, back to drinking. Would you like super salad? Uh, can I do both? No. Just drink your water and shut up. <laughs> drink your water and shut up. Hmm. <clears throat> I said, hmm. Oh, sorry, I wasn't really listening to you trying to get attention. Oh, how are you doing, old Stevie? Well, I just quit smoking and uh, coffee and... Wow, at the same time? You must be brave. Well, I hate to say this, but sometimes I feel like a real hero and inspiration to other people. Now, if there's only something I can do about my nihilism and sarcasm... Oh, uh, did you hear that the U.S. might be sending troops over... Yeah, Hawaii well, didn't like the idea of becoming a state... Well, I heard the real story that they were sent there to fight volcanoes and stuff like that. Can you imagine shooting bullets at a volcano? I really hate talking about politics, do you mind? Huh, not at all. You should know, his drink's going on your tab. It goes per table. I hope you know that. Your money's no good here. We don't accept people playing other people's debt, do you mind? Well, how about this will sweeten up the deal? Look at all this money. Well, I think your friend's really eyeing that money, so you probably keep it safe. <laughs> okay, I got my own money. Uh, yeah, here, uh, t take this money. Uh, this is for the table. Hmm, well then fine. I'll just, uh, go grab my money and just put it back in my wallet. Uh, you try to do what I said money, and you gotta get all you get. Hmm. Mm. Time to do some robbing. All right, hey guys, welcome back. Let's talk about some city council. Um, so one of the things that are going on that are ongoing within the city of Missoula is just, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, recently the uh, city of Missoula is looking to uh, sell the bridge apartments, which was acquired through uh, the uh, uh, kind of like last means. A lot of the people who live in the bridge, uh, bridge apartments are ADA uh, adults. Um, part of this is that they're trying to find somebody to uh, maintain uh, the affordability of this. And so they worked a deal with uh, one of the, uh, for Blue Line, uh, to sell it for about $1 million, even though the city spent $2 million on it. And during public comment, Travis Mateer, uh reacted to uh, how the city uh, spent money on this and is uh, essentially losing money on this. The Missoula Redevelopment Agency might be selling the bridge apartments for a million dollars after buying it for $2.1 million. Now we know it's really more complicated um, than, you know, buying for $2.1 million and selling for a loss. There's subsidized housing considerations, but the first consideration, the first purchaser of consideration uh, will be a uh, affordable housing uh, developer. And I have serious concerns about conflicts of interest between the Missoula Redevelopment Agency and this affordable housing developer. And so um, as we look at a hot housing market and there's lots of conversations happening about uh, what we can do to help people that might need some subsidized housing. It just, it confounds me how we could be spending $2.1 million in public money and then flipping this property for less. It kind of makes me think of the sleepy inn and that doesn't give me good feelings because I think there wasn't a lot of like money made quite yet in that deal either. So um, I don't know if the city is a good real estate agent. Um, I know there's some concerns when there's a six figure donation to a potential mayoral candidate, but when it comes to the city doing real estate deals, man, maybe 
do better. Thanks. All right. So that was Travis Mateer with public comment. Um, in many ways, you know, if you really look into it a little bit deeper, uh, the Blue Line uh, property management uh, basically was the only one to agree to the terms of how they would uh, manage the property, keep the people inside, and uh, any kind of uh, d redevelopment within the building to expand while at the same time not kicking people out. And, you know, in, the, um, in other ways, you know, the city of Missoula could have easily just uh, bought it and sold it for a profit. And then the people who were living there could have uh, just uh, moved on. I mean, those are one of the uh, many scenarios that could have easily happened. But for the most part, Missoula made the investment to keep the 40 uh, residents, 40 units open for affordability to keep these, uh, the status quo for a lot of these people to pay that rent. Um, during public comment, uh, one of the uh, uh, regulars who also happens to be homeless, Clayton Shane, uh, spoke about the uh, trying to survive in a, uh, in a town that would move him along anytime he would uh, get comfortable. There are some of us that are trying so hard to help. And I can't put down a camp for a day that somebody doesn't come out and give me a disorderly conduct, a public nuisance, a trespass, as I'm doing exactly what I've been told to do. It is so confronted. No one knows which way is up. And so there's nowhere to lead or show anybody to go either. Take a degradant piece of a ward and give it to us to reclaim. If you don't want us on riverbanks and pathways, give us something to work on. Let some people show some intention and give those people something for doing it. Show incentive. Or sit down and talk to us. <laughs> there are a lot of ideas. Bucking up the Johnson into eight inch or eight foot squares and making it storage so that people don't have all their stuff out on the streets. That space could have been used all summer and you'd have one attendant all day letting one person in at a time and watching them and there's no theft and there's cameras and it's all already in place. Every time I've come here, I've tried to come up with another idea that could at least help us float an idea and try it. Okay. You know, those are some of the comments that were made during the council as we jump into the consent agenda, uh, which they're talking about money for the roundabout. Who should pay? What's going on with this particular thing? Uh, Julie Anton, resident, thinks uh, congestion will not affect the roundabout, and she's one of the residents of Lower Miller Creek who is opposed to the roundabout, especially when it comes to uh, uh, residents of Lower Miller Creek who don't even use the roundabout. Development of the Riverfront Trails project, a significant amount of traffic will begin to enter onto Lower Miller Creek Road at this 90 degree corner. This roadway geometry creates safety issues based on the fact that the through movements on Lower Miller Creek Road translate to left and right turns. This can cause confusion for vehicles entering from Old Bitterroot Road, which is where the Riverfront Trails neighborhood will be, and has the potential to cause safety problems. The study itself states that the safety issue is being created due to the development of the Riverfront Trail subdivision and that the reason for the roundabout would benefit them. Point six, I'm almost done. Um, it's my understanding that the multitude of roundabouts recently installed in the Mullen Road area weren't passed along to residents as a SID. If you insist on passing along any portion of the roundabout cost on Lower Miller Creek to anyone other than the developer, Maybe as opposed to placing a SID on Lower Miller Creek residents, the city can find more creative ways, similar to how the Mullen Road project was handled to fund the balance. Okay. And so that was one of the uh, comments that we're going to uh, be reflecting on the uh, Riverfront Trail. And Riverfront uh, Trail community basically is going to kind of create a whole kind of neighborhood in that general area, which is going to impact traffic in the lower Miller Creek. And so far, there's a 90 degree uh, single lane turn that goes out. And one of the only places that happens to be out there is a lot of housing, suburban development and the Jan Janet Rakin School. And for the most part, uh, a lot of the traffic studies that they have done, uh, a lot of the skepticism for this was also they, uh, they are asking that the city didn't take into account the fact that people travel back and forth consistently with, uh, within the parameters of school, you know, dropping off, picking up, dropping off, picking up, beginning and end of the school day. So um, Alex uh, Gregorio, Leadership Council for Lower Middle Creek responds to this as well and talks a little bit more about that. So this is what he had to say when well over half of Miller Creek never goes that direction, they won't use this roundabout. 
And so I think it just goes to show that the people that truly need this roundabout are the people that are going to live in this new neighborhood here, and therefore they should be the ones that pay for it. If you roll that cost over onto the developer, they'll no doubt roll the cost onto the buyers of those lots. If you spread it out over 160, 176 lots, it would be about $4,900 a lot. The average house in Miller Creek costs $660,000. So if you tack another 4,900 onto there, it's less than 1%. So I think in the end, this is something that everybody can get on board with. And if the developer pays for the entire roundabout, that's the most just thing for the neighborhood in the future. Hey guys, sorry, I'm just... Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, there's also a couple things going on here in the library as well as I'm doing some recordings. And so, yeah, I mean, this is kind of like a reflection of the Riverfront Trails talking about, you know, some of the new development. They talked a little bit more in length about this earlier on during the proceedings. Developers basically came and said that they didn't feel like they should have to pay for a roundabout. But for the most times, people of Lower Miller Creek have kind of come up and have spoken uh, very uh, eloquently in terms of being uh, uh, concerned about uh, paying for something uh, just in general, not to mention on top of the fact that they will be uh, uh, utilizing a, another SID program, Special Improvement District uh, tax for that general area to build a sidewalk for safety in that general area, especially since they developed a new school in that area. So sidewalks would be a beneficial and trails as well to help people moving forward. So um, John Contos from City Council does did, responded to uh, many of the folks at the Riverfront Trails. This is what he had to say. First of all, uh, I, I don't agree that people should have to pay for this. I, I understand there needs to be a roundabout there that's going to get developed, whether we like it or not. But it's the way this has been going about, really not the fairest situation. Um, I think the biggest thing is for people to have to pay for this if that development site wasn't there. Uh, several people have said that wasn't there no uh, the way things are going <coughs> there'll be a few more houses up on the hill but everything works so because of this development there's a roundabout and the people that are starting to live there are the houses that are going to be built responsibility should be on that but I think the biggest thing is is just it's kind of our responsibility to listen to people and uh, not be so quick to shove things through all right, so uh, like everyone was talking about, this uh, item did go back to a uh, committee to talk a little bit further about this. Uh, they did speak about uh, the police budget and with some uh, comments, the uh, consensus was clear that the collective bargaining agreement would help give better pay to Missoula police and retain and train new officers with an increase of a, about $1 million budget. Uh, we're gonna jump right into uh, the Johnson Street Shelter because we're going into uh, you know, housing committee meeting. So uh, one of the things that they're talking about, an update on reopening the, uh, after the city declared a state of emergency. And so far uh, by opening the shelter, its budget reflects services for one year max. Aaron Pian, Housing Community Management, talks operation and budget in terms of this, and this is Aaron Pian. We have a new budget request into council for about $1.7 million, and that just looks at our um, the cost that the city will be covering in terms of um, operations for the shelter facility. Those funds are um, identified as coming from ARPA reserves or ARPA funding that we have on hand, not general fund. Um, and that constitutes the city's portion. Um, we are working with MRA on <clears throat> potential funding to cover the cost of the facility renovations. That has not gone before the MRA board yet in a formal request, but we've identified that as potential funds to cover some of those costs. And, and so uh, with that, they uh, talked a little bit more about uh, how they wanted to use the funding mechanism uh, to basically build uh, shelters and uh, uh, basically more showers, 
better facilities in terms of uh, better hygiene and more uh, just just more in general. So Emily Armstrong Community Development talks about the short term turnaround when reopening the shelter as the city of Missoula didn't have too many other options to open a space. Those are conversations we are continuing to have now. As, as we've said previously, we are not committed to this as a long-term solution. It's the solution for this moment. Um, and I think our, our group of houseless leaders and all of our community partners and all of us who are involved from the city and county um, levels are very aware that there may be other solutions that are better for our community. Um, and we're just not sure yet what those are. We're hopeful to discover that. Um. Okay. Yep. So, uh, you know, like a lot of, uh, a lot of the money that was used to open a lot of those, uh, outdoor spaces, the safe outdoor space, the temporary safe outdoor space, the, uh, the, the shelter just off by the, uh, uh the Walmart, by uh, the Reserve Street encampment that used to be there. That was just one of the many things that they were able to use. And, you know, and so far they do, like I said before, they do plan to build structures for bathroom showers and basic hygiene use. And Mike Nugent and uh, Mayor Jordan Hess talk about the impacts to the neighborhood and just in terms of just how this is gonna impact, you know, people in the Johnson Street, Franklin to the Ford area, um, Montana Railing Park, and not to mention just the Pavarella in terms of that particular area as well. So this is the back and forth between Mike Nugent and Mayor Jordan Hess. Are we gonna, how are we going to help the neighborhood with the the kind of adjacent issues of living next to a shelter? And, you know, and, uh, I think that that maybe we, we had a solution two years ago that was too extreme. And some of the feedback we've gotten is the solution last year was maybe not enough. So and, and maybe there's not an answer for this today, but something to put a pin in. And I think it is something that a lot of us would would want to know more about. Yeah, and your your comment uh, jogged my memory that it, that um, the uh, when we when we bring back the um, Title Twelve changes, um, there's opportunity to look at areas where it's um, where it's maybe not appropriate at all to allow camping. So we we may the council may decide that um, within a buffer zone of shelters, uh, we we don't have tolerance for camping, um, or uh, that we um, that we have different regulations within a buffer zone of the Johnson Street shelter or the the Pavarello Center, um, in order to um, provide. Um, a, a, a buffer for those neighborhoods um, and prevent problematic behaviors um, right outside those shelters. I know that um, that's something that's that's common in communities, and that's something that um, that we could certainly look at among other among other uh, potential buffers. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, I'm dealing with an emergency shelter. I mean, emergency. Uh, um, drill that's happening here in the uh, library. So don't be alarmed. This is an only. This is only a test, so we're going to jump right on to my next quote, uh, which actually is going to jump right into the con uh, conservation uh, and parks. We're going back into Paul Kim's presentation on the forgotten burial grounds of the Chinese migrants during the turn of the century. Paul Kim uh, responds to how the JEDI program applies to modern day Chinese in Missoula and in Montana, and this is what he had to say. Say this definitively, but I'd be hard pressed to find a Chinese family in this town. Um, and then across the state of Montana, the Chinese families that remain are pretty exclusively uh, the family that operates Beacon Parlor to this day, um, and uh, families that have relocated to Seattle and San Francisco, but maintain relationships with the Maiwa Society and the Maiwa Museum in Butte. So I hope that answers some of the concerns that the Jedi specialist brought up. Yeah, so I'm definitely dealing with a lot today. I did not expect this actually to happen, so we're just going to go on and move on. So Kim mentions the last family, uh, Chinese family that lived in Missoula was in the 1930s, which got an opt-in in the paper about how cool it was that a Chinese family was living in Missoula. Heidi West City Council talks about the resolution, but gets pushed back from Paul Kim in terms of a certain line of the... Uh, um, of the whereas and the resolution. We're particularly concerned about the ninth whereas, um, and I think that we need to have a little bit more um, conversation about whether or not that language is appropriate. And I don't, um, uh, yeah. And and I will also say that I did specifically mention the Chinese community in front of council in 2020 because I feel like a lot of our conversations around BIPOC representation um, really omitted this part of our history back um, during that process. And I am actually very glad that this is a conversation we're having. Um, so I am supportive of this generally. 
Um, I do think we need um, to have um, express buy-in from the county commissioners, um, and, and we're not quite there yet. So Could you read is, the ninth whereas? I just can't remember it. <laughs> it is whereas Montana politicians across the political spectrum continue to fear monger and scapegoat Asians and Asians and Americans. That whereas is specifically in reference to comment made by the senior senator from the state of Montana three weeks ago to an NPR reporter where he said, any individual who buys land in the United States from China is guilty until proven innocent. That's the control they have of their government over there. So let's just say guilty until proven innocent. And so I think that council needs to make a decision here on exactly how they feel about that type of rhetoric. And it's not new and it's not specific to Senator Tester. It's not specific to either party. It's something where 24 mailers that contained anti-Chinese content, messages like Steve Daines doesn't stand for Montana, he stands for communist China, were used in the last election. So I appreciate the counselor bringing up and reading that into the public record. I would love to make this a referendum on whether or not that is racist. All right. So I'm sorry, this is just kind of like the world, uh, the show I'm living in today. Um, and so the rest of the meeting was off uh, and the city was worried about continuing the discussion. The ninth whereas previously stated has across the board hesitancy from both city and county moving forward with the wording and the resolution to return to committee and work this out further. Public safety and health talk about the central housing strategies lobbyist for Missoula, uh, Jessica Miller, who has been giving Montana legislative updates in the past and representing uh, uh, Montana, talks a little bit more about this and what she's been doing. This contract that we're bringing forward today is for interim lobby work as well as the 2025 session. We discovered, um, we've discovered with a lot of the work that we need to be doing as far as um, housing and unhoused issues and property tax reform. These are not things that we can get done with just the 90 day session. So this contract will allow us to um, help keep on top of some of the interim committee work because that work has started. Uh, so they'll be representing our position and priorities and committees, uh, helping us work with our partners and keeping us informed of relevant committee work, um, as well as work that happens um, outside the legislature. Uh, they're going All right, so that was Jessica Miller, our lobbyist for the organization that they use. Um, we're going to jump right into some public comment uh, in response to it. It's maybe um, a little bit more clean to go from a lobbyist to a politician, if that might be the reality down the road, than let's say a nonprofit director into a politician. I think that's a little bit more problematic than than having a lobbyist get one hundred seven thousand dollars and one hundred seven thousand and five hundred dollars. Um, and then it's going to be great if this is only partially funded to continue looking at sort of the budget intricacies in what we should be funding in terms of the legislature. I really can concur having gone to the legislature um, that Missoula is not taken seriously, even when it comes to tax increment financing. Um, all of that SB 523 action, well, it just it was depicted as a Missoula problem. And so there is a lot of stuff at the state level that I think is going to be awesome um, to, to do. But when it comes to maybe this particular contract, I agree. With Mr. Larson, we need maybe some more time to review options. I think there's other lobbyists out there, and sometimes I even talk to them. All right, so that was Travis Matier uh, coming from the comment of why bother paying for a lobbyist in the first place when people don't even listen to the city of Missoula in the state of Montana. Hence, the city of Missoula's liberal, you know, blue in a uh, predominantly fairly big red state. In many ways, the city of Missoula is one of many communities in the Montana legislation tends to ignore and in recent uh, with Zoe Zephyr being silenced, uh, who is a representative of the city of Missoula. Gwen Jones, a defense lobbyist for Missoula, and this is what she had to say about that. There is a lot of work that gets done in interim committees. And yeah, I think periodically having some update on what those interim committees are working on and what direction things are turning in would be great. Um, and I'm just really glad that we are not looking solely at the legislative session, but that we are looking at the time in between sessions, because I think it's probably when the majority of work gets done and that's when we can lay the foundation to actually hopefully 
accomplish something. I know the League of Cities and Towns does a huge amount of work, and some of the some of the good bills it got through were because a hu- all of the foundation had been laid during the during the interim. So I'm glad that we're going to bring a voice to that and keep a finger on the pulse and and hopefully help provide communication and information and um, trying to point things in the right direction. So I'm happy to vote for this. All right. So the city did move forward in voting and moving this to the consent agenda in which they will <coughs> continue to uh, look to fund a lobbyist to represent the city of Missoula um, and to uh, imply the, the best interests of our city to help benefit the community as a whole. Having boots on the ground is an easy task and it, it, it's even easier to throw up one's hands to dismiss the tool that doesn't uh, match the state's agenda, but when there is an opening for input, they can be very useful in persuading intent. Uh, sometimes it feels like nothing can ever change, and Missoula is on the bubble trying to figure out what is best for Missoula while trying to invest in policies that would impact communities in a positive light. Uh, losing is essentially giving up on trying, and this is through the mayor's office budget to move this forward for the next couple of years through the 2025 legislative session. So with that, I conclude my city council report and the uh, fire test, which I wasn't aware of, which I thought was going to happen on August 30th, uh, finally ended. And so now I can talk a little bit more about some events that are happening here in the city of Missoula. Besides all those uh, uh, summer camps that are going on for them kids, you can go to MissoulaEvents.net to find out what's going on in the city of Missoula. Um, if you're interested in doing any 3D printing, scanning, or anything like that, Missoula Public Library has the maker space. They open at 930, and they're pretty much open walk-in hours for folks who just want to do that kind of stuff. Um, we also have uh, uh, Tiny Tales and story time here at the Public Library starting around 10.30 a.m. Those of you who like the idea of uh, having your kids exposed to reading books and stuff like that, always great for kids who are four and under, preschool age, just as they're getting involved with that kind of stuff. Not to mention Spectrum Discovery Center on the second floor also is a great way for kids to get uh, engaged with uh, engineering, science, and more uh, over on the second floor. So a lot of things happen on the second floor here at the Bazoo Public Library. And on top of that, <coughs> We also have our, um, uh, let's say, our uh, yarns, which is at noon on the fourth floor in the Blackfoot boardroom. And that's for people who just like to stitch, snow, uh, uh, sew, and beyond just to kind of knit and just kind of hang out in the uh, environment with other people around noon today at the Public Library. Uh, Lego Club happens at uh, 2.30 uh, this afternoon. Um, and then we have D&D for adults at 6 p.m. This is an online thing that's hosted by our very own Brian here at the Missoula Public Library. But we're gonna jump back into more things happening in and around the city of Missoula, which include the Missoula Food Bank meal distribution. So if you are uh, food insecure, Missoula Food Bank's the place to go. They don't discriminate. You don't even have to uh, not uh, pre be, be, be pre-qualified for assistance. It is a wonderful resource, a local uh, community food hub for a lot of folks, and also uh, works with uh, Spectrum and um, uh, the Missoula Public Library. So there's a lot of uh, parts community center and food center. Uh, Fridays, they're open from 10 to 1 p.m., but Tuesdays, Thursdays, they're open for pretty much uh, kind of like a 10 to 6 p.m. kind of deal. So you can find out more hours by going to the MissoulaFoodBank.org. Um, let's, uh, what else is going on here and around? Uh, there's an art ex ex exhibition opening. Um, what we need is here, and this is going to be at the uh, Radius Gallery. And so this kind of uh, features the art from, give it a second, it's still loading. Uh, the art uh, by Britta Anderson, Louis uh, Lamentag, uh, Kay Bonoma, Leslie, uh, Bobby McKibben, uh, Erica Parkin, and Yupa Stein. The title of the exhibit comes from a poem of the same name by Wendell Berry and is called What We Need Is Here. Uh, that's happening starting at 11 and it's just an uh, art ex 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 exhibition so you can pop in anytime um, and just check out some of the art that they have there. Um, <coughs> If you're interested in doing some UDASH service uh, throughout the rest of the summer, you can get some free uh, uh, trips up the river to go float down UDASH from 12 to about 6 p.m. in the uh, up, uh, up on campus drive. Um, you just jump on the UDASH, go up the river, and then just take your tube and just float down the river, and you can repeat all day. And this goes on Thursday through Sunday from 12 to 6 p.m., and 6 p.m. is their last uh, ride up the river. So 
Uh, let's see, what else is going on in and around the city of Missoula as well? Uh, Blackbeard the Pirate at MCT Missoula Children's Theater is doing a uh, show of Blackbeard the Pirate, which hosts a, a group of kids throughout the week, and then they have a 4 p.m. and 6 p.m. show at the Missoula Children's Theater. Not to mention the uh, Zach Girl Rock Camp 2 performance. Zootown Arts Community Center is hosting a, a camp rock performance at 4 p.m. Uh, for uh, kids and the community to uh, basically ha uh, watch a f newly formed band throughout the week of their camp and have them perform. Um, Fact and Fiction is doing the story slash song time with Chris Sand and the Rappin' Cowboy. That's at 4 p.m. at the Fact and Fiction. Uh, let's see. Fat Fits Plus Size Pop-Up Shop. Missoula Makers Collective is hosting a Fat Fits Plus Size Pop-Up Shop for folks who are a little bit plus size like myself. Um, Parents Night Out, Christmas in July, Hearts of Fire Pottery and Art Studio, if you're interested in doing that kind of stuff. Uh, it's a, one of the many pottery and art studios here in town. Um, Imagination Brewing Company is doing some folk music uh, with Eddie Roy and Max Laporte. Uh, they're doing a taste testing and tour with cider maker Chloe at Western Cider, and that's at 6 p.m. tonight. Uh, the Absent Wilson Conspiracy at Ten Spoon. It's going to be some jazz music starting at 6 p.m. at Ten Spoon Winery up the Rattlesnake. Goth Babe is going to be at the Wilmo Theater. It's going to be some acoustic music. Um, there's karaoke at the Jack Saloon at 7 p.m. You got four history buffs at the Missoula Public Library if you're interested in doing some things after hours. They're talking about Mullen Monuments with uh, Leif Fredrickson, and they're going to be talking about the Mullen Monuments. So we love talking about uh, uh, Mullen for sure. Um, Cosmic Lake uh, Paint Night, Painting with a Twist, is doing a class at 7 p.m. Dark Horse is having a rock show with the Walking Corpse Syndrome. They're a pretty predominant band here in the city of Missoula, and they've been playing for well over 20 years, I believe. Uh, New Wave Studio Music Showcase. Uh, Monk's Bar is going to be playing some hip-hop music starting at 8 p.m. Gravy Ladies at the Old Post at 8 p.m. Um, Laughs on the Lawn at the Barn in Missoula. It's going to be a comedy show at 8 p.m. Cash for Junkers is going to be at UD Club. <coughs> and that sneeze indicates the end of Friday, and we're going <laughs> to transition into Saturday as the uh, w uh, morning market start at 8 a.m., go until about 1 p.m. If you're interested in doing some farmer's market fun, you can enjoy fresh food, cooked food, um, produce, and more over at the Farmer's Market, which happens every Saturday well into well in through October. So that's happening and it's ongoing. They always have a bunch of other events. I heard even heard on the radio that they might do a car show at the Karis Park. So there's definitely a lot of stuff happening in the downtown Missoula area. And um, let's see, there's the 27th annual Madison Valley Arts Festival. So this one is like, let's open another tab to talk a little bit more about this. And this is uh, part of the NS Arts Association which holds its 27th annual Madison Valley Arts. The venue is Pete, Peter T's Park. And so this is in Ennis, Montana. And it's at 313, 213 Main Street in Ennis, in addition to 60 juried artists. There will be a live entertainment by the music Bach and Friends who sing and play bluegrass, fiddle tunes, and cowboy songs. And that's going to be happening uh, starting at 10 a.m. in Ennis, Montana. If you want to just go on a trip, uh, backpack Getaway, Verizon Cellular Plus in Missoula. Um, no, I don't want to talk about well, that. Uh, that sounds more commercial. Um, let's see. Saturday. All, no, 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 no. Okay. Call to worship at Karis Park. If you want to worship and you want to be a uh, part of that kind of a thing, a day of worship in the most high God with multiple bands, a day of testimony with varied testimonies interwoven throughout the day, full day of fun with food, dessert, trucks available. Um, and that's going to be happening at Karis Park starting at 11 tomorrow. Um, let's see. <clears throat> let's see what else is going on now. Clean Smurfit Stone Now, which is the Cryer River Axis. They're doing a, a Clean River Challenge where boaters and floaters in the Clark Fork River uh, through July 29th and 30th can participate in a fun on water contest while learning about the, uh, the shuttered uh, Smurfit Stone pump mill near Frenchtown and the dangers it poses to the river. The Clean Smurfit Stone Stout. Uh, Clean Smurfits Now Challenge will be held from noon to 6 p.m. at Elberton Gorge. If you're there in the River of the Week, you can come talk to American River staff at Cryer uh, River Access from noon to 6 p.m. Saturday and Sunday to learn how to participate in this challenge. And yeah, so let's see. 
D&D for Teens. So if you're a teenager and interested in doing some Dungeons and Dragons stuff, um, they host it at 3 p.m. the Missoula Public Library. It's online, so you can uh, jump on board. I believe it's also Brian who hosts that as well. Let's see what else is going on tonight. So if you're interested in some folk music, Imagination Brewing Company is hosting a folk band at 6 p.m. Britt Aronson and Friends. John Floridas is going to be at Toonspoon Winery at 6 p.m. Western Union Band is going to be playing some country music at the Jack Saloon starting at 7 p.m. Henry Rollins is going to be uh, performing comedy at the Wilma starting at 7 p.m. Revival Comedy presents Comedians with Disabilities. This is going to be at Zootown Arts Community Center starting at 7 p.m. Uh, Saturday night. And then there's uh, um, Bluegrass Music at the Free Cycles Missoula, North Fork Crossing Free Range Bow Show at Free Cycles. Live music with the Pack Strings at uh, the Cranky Sam Public House featuring um, live music by uh, Pack Strings. Tom Catmull is going to be at the Old Post at 8 p.m. on Saturday. Monks is going to be hosting uh, some miscellaneous uh, uh, club music. Riley James, uh, Sarah Fraser, Dope Controller. Um, it's mostly a lot of it's kind of experimental music, and that's going to happen at 8 p.m. on Saturday. Solid sound karaoke in the Bulldog Lounge. It's going to be some uh, Westside Lanes uh, typical karaoke every Saturday at 9 p.m. Ida Ranch Hands is going to be Union Club at 9 p.m. Uh, then we have Tokyo Godfathers is going to be a movie that's going to be playing at Head Start School on the north side um, the, for the Missoula Outdoor Cinema. They ask for donations, but, um, but for the most part, you can go there for free, and it goes to benefits the north side neighborhoods. And then finally, Chris Moon will be wrapping up with some DJ music at the ba Badlander every Saturday at starting at 10 p.m. Let's see, is there anything kind of happening on Sunday? There's Sunday brunch at Giraffe Works. Mm. <laughs> U-Dash River Service ongoing, like I said, Montana Flower Truck Paint Class, Paint with a Twist. Um, that's 2 p.m. on Sunday. Um, I usually don't talk too much about some of the Sunday events. There's a couple pinball tournaments at Odd Pitch at 4 p.m. Yeah, there's really not much going on there. I'm going to wrap up right there. And I'm going to thank you guys for joining me this morning. We are going to be posting our summer camp video from our Animation Camp 3. This is the kids who have uh, joined us for our uh, summer camp this week from Monday through Friday today. And we'll be wrapping up and we're going to be posting on our Facebook and YouTube page at 4 p.m. tonight for your entertainment entertainment and uh, their educational uh, needs as well. So they learn a little bit about video editing and make some movies along the way. And that's pretty much that. And if you want to learn more, you can go to um, MCAT.org. You can find us on YouTube and our Facebook page. You can find me on uh, my Facebook page, Wake Up Missoula, and more through uh, my YouTube page, Wake Up Missoula. You can't miss it. It's pretty simple. Um, but for the most part, I want to thank you guys for joining me and for Wake Up Missoula. I am Scott. Um, Hold on a second. I'm just... Okay. I'm all backwards today. Hopefully I won't fuck the rest of the weekend. Mm, goodbye.